Coming up on Magical Medical Tour with my co-host, Dr. Glenn Woolman, and special guest, Dr. Carrie Prezon, author of Surviving American Medicine. Have you ever felt fear or unease when going to see a doctor? How do we know that this doctor is right for us? What questions should we ask when facing a life-threatening disease? Join us for an educational and inspirational moment coming up next here on YHTV. This week's episode is brought to you by Support the Mountain's Herbal Parasite Cleanse. This formula targets the small and large intestinal tracts and larvae, the most broad-spectrum formula available today. 100% organic, formulated by Dr. Mikio Sanki, author of the Esoteric Acupuncture Series. For 10% off your first bottle, visit shopyogahub.com and use the coupon code CLEANSE at checkout. Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today for Surviving American Medicine. I'm Christina Suzuma and with me is our wonderful co-host and medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. What's up, Doc? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. So much is up. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I am Dr. Glenn Wallman, and I will be your host along with Christina today as we travel through the healthcare galaxy, always exploring ways to achieve optimal health. And today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Kerry Prezant, who is an internist. He's a hematologist and an oncologist. Those are some big words, and we're going to learn about those. He's also a researcher and a teacher and a new author Although he's been writing uh, journal articles for a long time and has many articles, he has a new book out called Surviving American Medicine. And boy, I think that's a topic that we need to talk about today. No, Don't you, Christina? Oh, <laughs> yes. It's, it's one of those books that you have to keep around. Every household should have. <laughs> yeah. Very important. <laughs> and, and just like in preventive medicine, you should read this before you need to. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> but, but before we meet Dr. Prezant, uh, how would people get in touch with us? Well, thank you. At any time during the show, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment simply <coughs> by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. Now, you could be watching the show a week after we've aired it or a year or two. Go ahead and ask your question. It's always very important. And we'll make sure to get it to our guest or Dr. Woolman or myself, and we would definitely answer. Um, now, you can do that. Or if you're listening to this uh, in a podcast, you can always just pick up the phone and call us at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. And uh, be sure to leave your contact information there. And again, we will get right back to you. Thank you, Glenn. You're quite welcome. Uh, and before we move on, I want to thank uh, Curtis and Kelly for introducing me to Dr. Prezant. Uh, and so on behalf of uh, myself, Christina, and Magical Medical Tour, welcome, Dr. Prezant. How are you? Good morning. Very well. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us here. My pleasure. <laughs> Carrie, we have so much to talk about today uh, and so many important aspects of what you do and what you have to offer for us in terms of surviving American medicine. But I always like to start out uh, finding a little bit about you and then about your training, and then we'll get into uh, some more serious topics. So basically, I'm always interested, and we always like to know, what were the influences that got you into becoming a healer? and medicine, and then a little more specifically into hematology and oncology. Well, uh, I was always interested in science and math, and I had this hero who was my pediatrician when I was growing up. And when I was sick, if necessary, he'd come out to the house and do a house call. We'd go into his office. He'd give me a shot, but it wouldn't hurt too much. And I really admired how he was able to bring science to taking care of me. So I knew that I probably wanted to be a physician, help other people. And then further along, uh, it became very, very 
uh, appropriate for me to focus on science, focus on mathematics, and then to, in my uh, training, uh, find that uh, indeed medicine was really exciting and that doing research was also very exciting. So during medical school, I did some research uh, along in, in the summers. This was very helpful to me creating for myself a real picture of what I wanted to do to combine new areas with traditional and help people trying to uh, do a good job and trying to see if I could play an important role in people's lives. Uh, after after uh, uh, going to University of Buffalo uh, Medical School, I went off to Columbia University uh, and uh, Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, then on to the National Cancer Institute, then on to Washington University in St. Louis for additional training and stayed on there with my laboratory being active for about 10 years. And then I was recruited out to City of Hope, uh, a hospital, research hospital in Los Angeles. And we've had a wonderful career in both academic medicine, community medicine, uh, and a wonderful career in trying to help bring information to people and bring new ideas through publications. Beautiful. And you've done all of that, and we're going to try and touch on many aspects of that today. So your actual training was uh, four years of medical school, and then after that? Four years of medical school, a year of uh, internship, uh, two years in the public health service at the National Cancer Institute, uh, three years of additional uh, internal medicine and hematology and oncology training, and then you never stop learning. And so no, we've continued true. to learn all the time, even as recently as yesterday. And today is still not over, so I'm sure I'll learn more things today. Uh, and you have to be able to learn today because so much is changing in the world, isn't it? Uh, we know really? that healthcare is changing. We know that politics are changing. We know that uh, the nature of people and what they expect from medicine is indeed changing. And because of all that, I have to learn every day not only the new science but new methods of how I deliver that science to people in a meaningful way that they enjoy coming to see me, they get the right information, they feel better, but most importantly, they're able to enjoy their lives more fully and live longer. Mm. Christina, don't you get the sense that you wish every doctor in the world was like Dr. Prezan? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and, and you know, it's, it's so touching because his name, your name is <laughs> Present. Yes, living in the present moment. You're continuous. This is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Fran Drescher actually pointed out in the introduction, in the foreword to the book Surviving American Medicine, which I wrote. Uh, and I was uh, struck by the fact that she said exactly what you said. So it was very good. <laughs> so today, Carrie, I want to I want to talk a lot about your field of medicine, hematology and oncology, but I also want to. Uh, Use all of the things that you t spoke about in your book, um, Surviving American Medicine. So probably almost every question, there'll be more of a specific answer for something with the science. And then I want to bring in how that relates to surviving uh, as a patient. So th the first question I really want to talk about is what is... What made you choose hematology and oncology? I know that when we both were starting our practices, uh, at that time, oncology or the study of cancers and mutations and cells and hematology, blood pathology, uh, that they didn't really have too much to offer. It was one of the toughest things I ever had to do and most doctors ever had to do was to tell a patient that they had cancer. And surprisingly, it seems like when you tell someone that, uh, they go deaf because they hear nothing else after that for a little while. And for a long time, we didn't have much to offer, but things have changed. Uh, so there's a lot more to offer. So I want to hear a little bit about why you chose hematology and oncology and what the practice has been like for you in general. When I started in medical school, the cure rate was very low. Uh, cure rates were uh, around 20%. Uh, and then as I looked at what I wanted to do, I thought we should be able to improve the cure rates and indeed through many 
types of approaches, uh, cure rates are now up around 60%, 70%, and for some diseases, 90%. At the same time, I wanted to be able to take and help patients who had cancer that had come back, cancer that had recurred, and there were no cures for those patients when I first started out. Today, we have cures for those patients, and I wanted to help to play a role in bringing those cures forward. Uh, the field has improved dramatically. Number one, we used to have very poor chemotherapy, uh, limited hormonal therapy, no immunotherapy, no biological therapy, and yet today we have so many new treatments. We have excellent chemotherapy with fewer side effects than before and with medicines that can control those side effects. So people who used to fear, oh, nausea, vomiting, I'm going to be feeling terrible, today we have medicine that nearly completely prevents that. We used to have very poor hormonal treatments that lasted only for, short, for a very short time. Today, hormonal treatments with fewer side effects can last much, much longer for years even. We know that we have biological therapy now that identifies and targets certain types of abnormal genes or abnormal proteins in cancer cells, which now we can test for in the laboratory before we even start therapy. So therefore, we know what combination of treatments are important. And today we also have the emerging burgeoning field of immunotherapy, where patients can get medicines that help their own immune, therapy, immune system to actually fight the cancer and in many cases to control it and even cure the cancer. Uh, we also know that we now have cellular therapies for diseases like prostate cancer and leukemia and for lymphomas. And these cellular therapies take a body's own cells. We take them out and put them in the laboratory. And at the laboratory, we change them and create super active killer cells that come back into the body by just a simple transfusion, and then those cells seek out and kill the cancers. These are very exciting therapies, none of them really cheap, but very exciting therapies that we can bring to patients. And with the emergence of new types of healthcare system changes, like different insurances, different kinds of catastrophic insurances, we now have ways that we can afford expensive medications as they are developed, and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do that as we go forward in the next decades. I've had experiences with some of my clients where they were diagnosed with a certain type of a leukemia. Uh, the, the chemotherapies were failing. They had the possibility for a stem cell because this this one client had a sister who had the same uh a system that would be uh, allowed to enter this patient's body. But when they came to a, a point where they had to get healthy enough and destroy the cancer cells enough that they could survive the, the uh, stem cell therapy, their insurance company refused them on multiple occasions. And it was very frustrating. How do we survive that in America today? Well, this gets to the point of uh, several chapters in my book, Surviving American Medicine. And in this book, which uh, consists of how to find doctors, how to navigate the system, how to do things, there's several chapters on getting insurance, what kind of insurance to get, and most importantly, what to do when the insurance company says no to something. And typically, because a stem cell transplant is expensive, an insurance company might say no initially. But there are ways to get around that. Number one, you have to be with a good physician who's like you, not willing to take no for an answer. The physician can appeal a decision which was no to try to identify why you need that particular treatment. So there's an appeal that takes place on that level. You as a patient can appeal to the insurance company yourself, and they have patient advocacy sections in all insurance companies to say why you want to have that treatment done. And usually the reasons are, number one, your physician 
said it was important. Number two, you may have gotten a second opinion, or the physician may have gotten a second opinion at a tumor board where they say, yes, you need to have that treatment. If the insurance company still says no, then you have other options available to you. Uh, Number one, you can go to your employer's human resources section, because remember, so much insurance is through employers nowadays that the employer can go to bat for you through the human resources department and say, we paid for this insurance for our employee. We want this treatment because the doctors say this is needed. And so they can go to bat for you, or if you just have private insurance or government insurance, you can go to the state insurance department and say, can you go to bat for me because my insurance company is stonewalling me. You can go to your state assemblyman, your state senator, your state representative, and even to the governor. And, of course, they personally probably will not respond, but they have health care staffers who love to go to an insurance company and say, hey, wait a minute. Why aren't you approving something that was shown to be medically necessary for this patient? If you have national health insurance, like, for example, you have Medicare uh, or you have TRICARE if you've been uh, in the military, uh, you can go to your national uh, representative in the House of Representatives, your national senator, and you can appeal to them to get the kind of therapy that you need. You can even apply uh, and uh, send a note to the president. And, of course, again, the president, the senator, the representative might not themselves contact you, but their health staffers will. And they really want to make certain that patients who need a particular treatment aren't going to be denied it by an insurance company just for monetary reasons. And that's usually the major reason for that. It often, Glenn, requires a second opinion to make certain that what was recommended by your physician truly is medically necessary for you. And so in my book, I have a whole section on getting second opinions. When do you need them? Where do you get them? How do you get them? Your doctor will help you to find that out if that doctor is the right doctor for you. If the doctor just simply throws her hands up and says, oh, uh, I tried, I didn't succeed, so be it. Uh, that's not the right doctor for you. And you can on your own get a second opinion to try and make certain that the treatment that you've been recommended to you or you've read about in the paper, whether that's really appropriate for you or not. And for example, in your patient who needed a stem cell transplant, uh, those are situations where you want to do that rapidly, not delay and delay and delay. We just had a family member who was denied a new medication Uh, for his uh, malignancy, and the insurance company said, no, 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 that's not appropriate. Uh, He had a first opinion. He had a tumor board second opinion. Uh, These were very strong letters. He took those letters to the human resources department uh, where the insurance uh, was from. He took them at the same time to the state uh, department of insurance, department of health care, to the assemblyman and to the senator, and within a week, Uh, That decision was reversed. He had the medicine. It was paid for completely, and uh, he's on that medicine now. We hope it's working. That was just a great answer, and I think that Mm -hmm. needs to be listened to just so many times. The only part of that, and you you alluded to it with delay, delay, is – the the patient and the family are getting very frustrated and they know the cancer isn't holding off while the uh, insurance company is delaying. Uh, you know, so that becomes the, the biggest issue, I think. Uh, but all of your answers are just beautiful. Thank you for that. Well, what you say, Glenn, is really important because you don't want to be delayed in getting treatment. And that's the reason that you have to have the right health care team. It's not just your doctor. It's your doctor and the doctor's whole office. It's other doctors that you use. They might be consultants. They might be second opinions. Uh, It's your insurance agent or your human resources department that provides you with the insurance that you need. So the insurance company and the people who uh, can deal with the insurance company are part of your healthcare team. And don't forget your family. They can help. When, when you yourself seem overwhelmed by the serious nature of the disease, it's time to rely on your family, sometimes your friends, 
uh, to go to bat for you and help you to navigate the system. That's why when you go to a doctor's appointment, it's always valuable to have a family member or a friend go with you. You know, one of the scariest times that we experience as people is when we go see our doctor. What's the doctor going to tell me? And if you have a serious disease, is the doctor going to tell you that this is getting worse, that it, the treatment's not working, things like that? These are really scary times. And it's times like that where you need someone else, another set of ears, another set of eyes to help to understand what the doctor is doing or not doing for you so that you can make decisions in the right manner. So don't forget your family is part of your healthcare team too. Don't exclude them and by all means keep them active and interested in your in your care. Mm, lovely. There's so much in so many questions I have with it, with every statement that you have. One of one of the difficult things for physicians is to tell a patient they have cancer and you're you are as a hematologist oncologist you're usually the second person to tell them. It's usually, in many cases, they find it out from their doctor and then they're sent to you. Do you have some advice mm -hmm. for physicians in terms of how to approach the process of telling someone they have cancer? Now, we're going to talk about screening and prevention in a few minutes, but when someone other than yourself has that opportunity to tell someone they have cancer, and then what are the options? You know, you start hearing things like biologicals and chemotherapies and immunologicals. At the same time, you just heard you have cancer. How do, how do you recommend for other physicians to approach this? Well, the first thing is to make absolutely certain that it's cancer. So although we have a pathology report that says cancer, we know that sometimes that's not correct. So the physician uh, can sometimes ask for a second opinion or ask the pathologist to take that sample and review it with their peers to make certain whether a patient actually has cancer. Secondly, when, you're, when a doctor's talking with a patient and says you have cancer, if it's left at that, it's devastating because the patient does not know what to do. Am I going to be cured? Am I going to die next month from this? And all those worries go through their minds. So it's important to say, here's what we're going to do about the cancer. And of course, most of the physicians who diagnose cancer say, we're going to either take it out, surgeons say that, we're going to send you to another doctor who's really good, who can help you to deal with this, and hopefully can treat it, put it in remission, or cure it. And that's when they're referred to a radiation oncologist, they may re be referred to a medical oncologist or a hematologist, depending upon what they have. When I talk with patients, it's important to bring a plan at the same time that you say you have cancer. Because cancers are almost 99.99% treatable for control or for cure. And identifying the goal of treatment, we're going to get this in remission, it's going to stay in remission. If it pops out of remission, we've got something else for it so that the patient has hope that this will be controlled or hope that this will be cured. And both of those, you have to make certain that you bring a plan to the patient immediately. It's not enough to say, oh, I think we'll do some tests and I don't know what we're going to do. If you're going to do that, then the patient stays worried, stays anxious doesn't know what to do, and doesn't know how to relate to their family or their friends with regard to their condition. But if they know that there's a plan in place, and that it's going to be implemented uh, quickly, hopefully with insurance authorizations if need be, that uh, they know that something is going to be done, and they immediately have hope that really carries them forward and allows them to make all the logical decisions, etc. When I talk to patients about this, I also tell them, get advice from your family and from the internet. Uh, I tell them where to go in the internet. And again, uh, the book, Surviving American Medicine, has a chapter in it on trusted sites in the internet that you can go to for good information about the disease. And I tell them, don't just read that, but actually write down questions to bring back to me. 
so that I can answer any questions that you have about that. Uh, the more that you bring to me, the more we can answer your questions so you have total confidence and total trust and total hope for the future. Boy, I'm just taking lots of deep breaths here. Uh, <laughs> Because, because, I mean, this is a very serious topic, and, and more and more people, because of our environment and foods and many other things, cancers seem to be increasing, at least, uh, you know, in my mind, they seem to be increasing. Now the cures seem to also be increasing and the, and the therapies. So when somebody gets a diagnosis of a cancer, uh, and there are mul multiple options you know, you hear, well, we could do chemo, biochemistry, stem cells, immunology. How does someone make a decision what to do? And especially if they have a doctor that likes one and just, you know, in the, in the case where you, you're experienced with one, so that's what you try to push. How does someone get the opportunity to know there are many and make the choice between all of them? Well, that's the reason, Glenn, that I recommend that people go to the Internet to get information. I also, mm -hmm. in the book, point out that they can also go to uh, patient groups that are uh, together who help to support the patient. So there are breast cancer support groups. There are lung cancer support groups. Uh, if you have chronic disease, there are heart disease groups. There are uh, leukemia groups. There are groups for every single disease. And those groups can help to bring more information to you. And you can, as you go to one of these groups, take down and write ideas that other people have for their care. And you can take back to your physician. Why am I not getting this? Should I get this? Should we do this now or in the future? What can happen? Second opinions are also very valuable. And thirdly, uh, you have to make certain that when the doctor says this is what you should be getting, you should always ask, are there any other options that doctors consider for my disease? Why should we get those or why shouldn't we get those? Do we consider them now? Have you already thought about those? Or are we going to consider them later? Uh, have you taken me to a tumor board for recommendations? Every hospital has tumor boards that where they discuss individual patients and come up with ideas. But I think the most important thing is having confidence in your physician and knowing that the physician is a good doctor for you. If you're referred to an oncologist, but you don't quite get that oncologist, you seem seems like he's more interested or she's more interested in one treatment rather than another, then you can always ask for the second opinion. Uh, and you can always, you always must be with a physician with whom you have complete trust and who has good communication skills for you. If you don't, if the doctor says, oh, you've got this, you need that, zip, done, I'm out. Uh, that's <laughs> not the kind of doctor you really want, especially when you're facing life-threatening condition. Uh, and you can understand that in those circumstances, it's necessary to get confidence in that physician by a second opinion uh, that confirms what that doctor wants to do or getting a second opinion that might recommend something else. And it might be a second opinion from someone else in that same community. You might have to go to a uh, tertiary or uh, referral center at a university. You might have uh, to uh, go to a different hospital. Uh, there are lots of different options. And in the book, I describe how you can consider which ones are appropriate for you. And you're in almost every insurance company, I don't know any that's ever refused, will approve a second opinion. It might be within the group of physicians that are contracted with the health plan. Uh, it might not be the university. It might not be a research center. But there will be other doctors who can discuss this with you. Now, is there a way that you can check on your own to see if what's been recommended for you sounds logical? And, for example, in oncology, uh, there is the NCCN, a National Comprehensive Cancer Network. They have a complete website. I refer to it in the book, Surviving American Medicine. Uh, it's a website that recommends the most up-to-date treatments for every single disease. There's a section on breast cancer, section on colon cancer, mm. leukemia, lymphoma, skin cancer, everything. And so you can go to that and they have, part of that website is designed for patients. So it's not described just in doctor terms, is described in lay terms. So you can understand, is this the right 
decision for me or is there something else that needs to be considered? And if you take that information back to your doctor and say, well, I saw on the NCCN that this is sometimes recommended, uh, that doctor will know you need to have a complete explanation of what's appropriate for you and what isn't. And the doctor should be very open to a second opinion if they have questions about what therapy is right for you. And speaking about therapy, when I was working in the hospital, aside from my emergency medicine, I also uh, started a hospital-based integrative medicine program, and it was always the oncologists that were embracing this. All of the other fields and specialties in medicine looked at it as snake oil, and, oh, yeah, you could do this if you want, but it's not going to make a difference. But the oncologists and hematologists uh, always seemed to embrace it. And at first, I got the idea that it was because they just didn't have anything else to offer, so why not? But I see more and more... Uh, cancer uh, therapies and treatment centers that now, while a person might be in their office getting an intravenous dose of chemotherapy, they might be also getting intravenous doses of vitamin C, and they might be getting some homeopathic remedies uh, to protect the liver in certain cases. What are your thoughts on all of that in terms of treatments? Well, I think the first thing is that a patient must be honest with the physician that these are the other things I'm taking. I'm taking, whether it's this vitamin or that vitamin or this nutrient, that nutrient, uh, or a special diet, uh, be honest with the physician so the physician can say, yes, all those things are fine, or you know, all those are good except for those antioxidants because they interfere with radiation, they interfere with chemotherapy, so don't take those the days that you're getting radiation or chemotherapy. And Therefore, the patient will get the right advice from the physician on which things are good and which things are bad. And so in my practice, one of the first things I do when a patient comes to me and says, this is my new diagnosis, I go through the therapies that I uh, want to plan for them to help to control or cure their disease. And then I say, here are the things you should do about diet. Here are the things you should do about nutrients, vitamins, etc. These are the things that can help to prevent this kinds of disease in the future in your family members or uh, others, uh, or prevent further cancers. The patients appreciate that because if I don't tell them, everyone else will tell them. And if everyone else tells them, they won't know what to do. And they could wind up taking the wrong thing at the wrong time, and everything falls to pieces. So your physician should be willing to answer questions about, tell me about alternative, we prefer to call it complementary types of therapies uh, that we hear about. Tell me about vitamins and nutrients, et cetera. And that every physician knows about these things in cancer, in hematology, in uh, even primary care physicians know a lot about this as well. Uh, we try in my practice to recommend things that have a good biological basis and have some evidence for it, whether it's laboratory evidence or whether it's real evidence in uh, clinical trials, so that the patients know that they're getting the things that are tested and can really offer them some meaningful types of benefit. We do not, Christina, recommend snake oil. Uh, <laughs> I should tell you that. There are medicines. <laughs> derived from snakes, but they're not in oncology right now. They're in, in uh, hematology. Oh. Nonetheless, uh, it's really important, uh, truly, to ask this question and be prepared for a good answer. Mm. Now, is there a national push for this? Well, there is from patients, mm. from people who are own these companies and want to sell them these types of products. But there's also a push because every comprehensive cancer center in the country is required by the government to have a section on complementary and alternative medicine where they can not only answer those questions for an individual patient, but can actually do research to test some of these things. So there are trials going on with high doses of vitamin C. There are trials going on with vitamin B6, vitamin B12, other types of nutrients. Uh, there are resveratrol trials going on. That's the component in red wine that has an activity against cancer cells. Uh, we see a lot of this. There's huge amounts going on in green tea and in other types of uh, oriental medicine uh, types of uh, treatments, which I think are going to be very helpful to us. It'll take a couple of years for these trials to mature, mm -hmm. but we'll have a better answer for, for patients. 
So I have a In question. Oh, sure. sorry. Um, what about like diet and exercise um, away from just supplements? Um, right. I mean, we, we hear a lot about the, the different, um, uh, for example, like juicing and um, more greens or a raw diet. What, what, what um, in your knowledge, do you have of this? Every patient today, Christina, has questions about diet, about exercise, about nutrients and vitamins. And because of this, I try to answer those questions initially. But if your doctor does not offer those types of informational elements to you when you first see them, it's really important to ask a question. What about nutrition? What about diet? What should I be doing? This helps the patient and it helps the family to know what they can do to help the patient. And this becomes very, very important. With diet, we know that diet is important in preventing cancer. We also know that diet is important in helping to support treatments that you're taking so that your nutrition stays high and that you don't lose weight and your immune system stays strong. So the American Cancer Society has a anti-cancer diet, which I subscribe to, and it's part of what also helps to prevent heart disease. It is a very healthy diet. Uh, it includes five helpings of fruits or vegetables or fruit juices or more than five every day. And so you can keep a little diary to find out how much am I actually having. It's not hard to hit five a day. And Make certain you take that. And you can do it through juicing, but you can do it just with regular uh, fruits and vegetables and, and fruit juices. Uh, greens are very important in that as well. Uh, less red meat, more chicken and fish, less smoked meats because of the nitrosamines in it. Uh, so diet is important and very easy for people to accommodate. Uh, it does include the possibility of juicing if you want. Uh, there are nutrients which are very, very important. And these nutrients we know can be, in some cases, preventive and in some mm. cases can help to support the treatment program that is proposed for you. Uh, I like to encourage my patients to have green tea, uh, four or five cups a day, or green tea pills, uh, resveratrol, one uh, helping of red wine a day, or resveratrol pills, which have uh, more than enough resveratrol in them. Uh, we recommend uh, curcumin or turmeric. And again, you can put it on as spices on your uh, food uh, once or twice a week, or you can take uh, curcumin and uh, turmeric or turmeric uh, pills. Uh, they're available in every pharmacy and every uh, big box store. And so I recommend those. I also recommend a multivitamin every day. Some patients do not have a very good diet. And if they don't, then the multivitamin helps. And it really makes certain that all the, the nutrients that are necessary for people uh, are in the diet in some fashion. Mm. Exercise is something that we've learned over the last decade. is so very, very important. It's important for prevention of cancer, prevention of heart disease, prevention of bone disease. So we know that exercise is important. I tell my patients start out mildly with five minutes a day and work it up as you can do. Mm -hmm. Most surprisingly, I mean, it's been astonishing to me, we find that patients who exercise have better outcomes. They have longer survival mm -hmm. and better cure rates than patients who don't exercise. And so... I recommend to my patients that they do some exercise uh, at least five out of seven days, at least five minutes a day, and work it up to higher levels. And this is helpful for them. And it also not only improves their outcomes with regard to cancer control, but it also improves their side effects. You know, people say, well, what's the most common side effect of cancer treatment? And they say, oh, it must be pain or it must be nausea and vomiting. But it isn't. The most common side effect that we see is indeed fatigue. And many people watching have seen fatigue with any kinds of illnesses, with any kinds of problems they have if they've had cancer. They know fatigue is a very important element. And so when you compare patients who uh, rest to try and get their energy back to patients who exercise even a little to try to increase their strength, 
we find that the people who do best are the people who exercise. Mm. The people who do worst are the couch potatoes resting up for the next day. That's not the best approach. Uh, exercise, you can get your rest in addition, but exercise at least a little bit every day, and that is most important. Uh, randomized trials have shown that this is clearly the way to go, and yet doctors sometimes never mention it at all. Mm-hmm. And so you have to ask the question of your physician, what should my diet be? What should nutrients, vitamins should I take? What about exercise? How much should I have? What's going on? And that's true whether it's cancer, blood diseases, leukemia, or whether it's heart disease, or whether it's lung disease, or bone disease, uh, diabetes, very important. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, you need to ask those questions. Don't assume that the doctor is going to tell you everything uh, just because they spent five minutes with you. Uh, You have to ask the questions and expect an answer. Mm -hmm. If you don't get an answer... Time for a second opinion. Thank you. Great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Try. They're yeah, really good. <laughs> Carrie, the, uh, there's a lot of regulations and laws in the United States, and sometimes that dictates drugs we can use, therapies we can use. So a lot of people, especially that are facing some kind of a cancer, hear about other countries that don't have the same rules, regulations, and laws. I'm going to go to Switzerland, or I'm going to Mexico, or I'm going to India. Uh, And there are centers in in these places. It's not just they're going to find a doctor in Mexico. They actually have centers where people go. I'm sure you're aware of this. What are your thoughts on this, and how do you guide people in terms of thinking about those kind of things, especially if they say, I don't want to do conventional therapy? I've had many, many patients who've done this. Uh, I've never had a patient who did well. I actually had one patient who did very well, and when uh, they said to me, I'm doing so well, I brought back a vial of this special nutrient that the doctors were giving me down in Mexico, and it's just worked wonderfully. My my lumps from my lymphoma are are all gone, and I I took this bottle out of the trash because I wanted to show you, you, maybe you can give it to your patients. And I looked at the bottle, and it was standard chemotherapy that we give in the United States all the time. Uh, <laughs> and it works very well <laughs> for patients. So sometimes what you think you're getting at a foreign place mm-hmm. uh, is actually standard therapy that you get at home, and you don't have to really travel. Uh, so I try to recommend to patients if they really want to go for special enemas or special vitamin therapy or such like that, uh, Use it as a complementary type of approach. I don't recommend that they go to other countries because we can give most of those things uh, here in the United States. But if they want to go, I recommend that they get their standard therapy first and then as uh, a maintenance, if you will, if they want to go to a different uh, country or if they want to take Mm. special nutrients, vitamins, do it at that time. So we complement standard therapy with the therapy that they've heard about. What we try to do is to say, here's our standard therapy, and we already recommend these other complementary therapies, whether it be exercise or nutrition, uh, vitamins, uh, diet, etc. Integrate those together at the beginning rather than waiting till later, uh, till uh, it might be uh, not important. Or if you take standard therapy out and just rely on this other type of complementary or alternative type of medicine, uh, that may not be sufficient to really get very good care of your disease. So, uh, again, ask questions of your physician. What about integrating this together with complementary medicine? And what things do you recommend? What things are, do you not recommend because it may produce more toxicity? We know there are some very bad things uh, that uh, are not good for uh, people together with certain types of therapies that they're getting, uh, whether it be chemotherapy or biological therapy. And so we want to make certain that patients ask the question so they can get the right answer. And if the doctor doesn't know the answer, saying, you know, I just don't know about those other nutrients and vitamins, uh, you can get a second opinion uh, at another center to try to get information about that. I have patients who also go to complementary uh, holistic healers, and we try to integrate the treatments they recommend together with our treatments at safe times and safe intervals. What about clinical trials? 
Well, in my book, Surviving American Medicine, I have a whole section on clinical trials. When might it be appropriate for you? When is it not appropriate for you? Uh, Clinical trials may make treatments available that otherwise would not be able to be accessed by the patient. Uh, If you hear about a new immunotherapy, it might be available, but it might be only available through a clinical trial. The first step is when you're with a physician, uh, and uh, usually it's an oncologist, say, tell me about clinical trials. Are there clinical trials that I should be getting right now? Are there clinical trials should I, that I should be considering in the future? What's coming for patients? And so I think that uh, in that particular circumstance, A physician who does not know what kinds of clinical trials would be appropriate for you might not be the right physician for you. And you should get a second opinion, perhaps at a uh, research center, that can suggest which clinical trials might be appropriate. A patient can do their first check on what clinical trials might be appropriate for them uh, at a place uh, online called clinicaltrials.gov. The government keeps a list of all the clinical trials that are available in the country for patients. And they keep it by disease and by the stage of the disease, so you need to know what those are. Uh, Your uh, cancer, is it lung cancer, colon cancer? Is it stage one or two or three or four? And then clinicaltrials.gov has a uh, series of clinical trials that might be available where they are available and uh, who the contact person is for those clinical trials. And for many clinical trials, they'll be available right where you are. And for many clinical trials, they uh, might require traveling. But most of the time, clinical trials are not necessary. It may be something that people want, but it might not be the necessary thing right at that particular time. Also, even though a clinical trial is described for, say, breast cancer stage 3, The individual patient might not qualify for the trial because they may have some other illness that prevents them from participating. Maybe they have heart disease. Uh, Maybe they have uh, problems with certain blood tests in liver or kidney that makes it dangerous for them to participate in the clinical trial. So in those circumstances, discussing it with the physician to know if the clinical trial is the wrong thing or is the right thing for you, becomes so very important. This is the reason that finding the right doctor for you is important and knowing what you personally would want. I have lots of patients who say, I don't want any clinical trial. I want only the stuff that's tried and true. I don't want to take a chance with new types of side effects or new types of problems that could arise. I have other patients who say, I just want the newest and the best regardless. Don't don't forego any of that. I want a clinical trial. So different folks want different approaches to clinical trials, and they want them at different times. Patients may say, I don't want a clinical trial now, but if I'm not doing well on standard therapy, tell me all about clinical trials so I know what's available in the future for me. And I try to tell patients that it's a changing landscape. Uh, Sometimes clinical trials today might not be available tomorrow. We need to see when's the appropriate time to use them. Uh, And tomorrow there may be brand new treatments that are in clinical trial that might be appropriate. You have to remember that doctors don't want to give you up as a patient. So you have to be willing to say to a doctor, listen, I know that I may have to go someplace else for this clinical trial, but if I do, I'll come back to you afterwards, after the clinical trial is done. I don't want you to think that you're losing me forever. Um, Many physicians are very reluctant to refer to another institution for a clinical trial. So you have to kind of get a judge uh, of the your doctor, are they willing to have you go someplace else or not? And you can say, well, you know, if I have to go to another institution, I'm willing to do that, but are you willing to send me to another institution to get a clinical trial? And if the doctor says, oh, I don't ever like to send you away from this community or away from my care or things like that, you have to be a little suspicious. Is that the right doctor for you? You want a doctor who has your interest at heart, not their own interest at heart. 
and she or he must be honest with you. And if you don't think they're being honest, then you you have to uh, ask further questions and get another uh, opinion. It's very important. Early detection and prevention are clearly something that uh, is important to all of us, but there's there's a mixed bag here. We look, for example, at the PSA test, the prostatic specific antigen test, where at one point many men were dying of prostate cancer, and then we came up with a test that was an early screening. And then over time, we found out that uh, many of these men were getting unnecessary surgeries, unnecessary biopsies, and it didn't change things. So now it went from no screening to PSA, and then now they're recommending not necessarily getting PSA tests, especially at certain ages. Women with mammograms, uh, exposure to radiation, uh, uh, and sometimes in the conferences that I've been going to recently where they're actually telling women not to even examine their breasts anymore because it it brings up, oh, they feel something, and then suddenly the, the anxiety and the tests that go through and then the surgeries and a number of things. So the changing landscape, as you said, it's a moving landscape. What's your thoughts on uh, screening and how we deal with it? Screening and prevention are crucially important. And uh, the most important take-home message is to realize that doctors spend five minutes with you. Much of that time might be typing in the computer, not even looking at you. How do you make certain that they're not just taking care of your sore throat or an earache or a cough? How do you make certain they're actually preventing the illnesses that you might get? So it's your responsibility to raise the question with your primary care physician uh, or gynecologist or, or uh, internist, whoever is taking care of you, and say, doctor, I'm really interested in knowing what my risk is for certain diseases, and I want to know what you're going to do and recommend for me to prevent them and how you're going to screen for them to make certain that we diagnose them early when they're curable, not late when my life might be at risk. In today's day and age, uh, we spend so little time face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball with a physician uh, that we really have to make certain that we ask these questions. So, number one, make certain you have health insurance. Number two, make certain you've got the right physician for you who will actually listen to you and can explain to you in language you understand uh, what's going on. Uh, Number three, when you go to the physician's office, write down in your list Not only your symptoms, but also write down what's my risk for certain diseases, heart disease, uh, lung disease, diabetes, cancer. What are we going to do to prevent all these diseases that I'm at risk for? And what are we going to do to screen for these diseases? Tell me exactly what the schedule is. I'll make certain that we keep to that schedule. The first part of that is figuring out what's your real risk for certain diseases, and you just simply have to look at your family history to know what your family's had. Their genes are your genes. What they had, you're very likely to have. In my family, it's a lot of heart disease, a little bit of cancer. Uh, In other families, it's diabetes, or it may be bone disease, or uh, all the other gastrointestinal disease. So your family doctor, uh, your primary care physician, internist, gynecologist should have a complete family history on you. And you should ask the question, should I have a genetic test to see if I'm personally at risk for these kinds of diseases? Second question is prevention. Here are my habits that I do. I either smoke or I don't smoke. I drink or I don't drink. Drugs or no drugs. Uh, Exercise, no exercise. Diet good, diet bad. Uh, Your doctor should know all of these things about you and say, because of your personal habits, this is what you're at risk for, and this is how we can prevent those types of diseases. And so by understanding that and also having your uh, examination, x-rays, whatever uh, has been done with you, 
Your doctor should know what your risk is of disease, be able to tell you what it is for you and for your family as well. And be able to say, you know, this is what we know as good preventive treatment, and this is what we know as the screening test that you need to have. If your doctor doesn't have the time to do this with you, you need a new doctor or a second opinion or a consultation. Uh, if your doctor can't explain in ways that you understand, sometimes it's language, sometimes it's time that they don't have, uh, sometimes they just don't have good communication skills, you may need a new doctor or a new <laughs> second opinion. Uh, you've got to be able to do this. And indeed, in my book, I have a, I have a chapter that says, here is how you can check if your doctor is the right doctor for you. It's only a very simple three-page, about 20 questions. Uh, it goes into different sections. Does the doctor have good training? Does the doctor uh, have an ability to explain to you what you have? Does the doctor communicate well? Does the doctor actually look in your eyes? And does that doctor uh, listen to you uh, so he hears what you're telling him? Uh, and does the doctor take enough time to uh, know that your treatment plan is appropriate for you? And uh, there's a point scoring system, and you can tell if your doctor's good for you or bad for you. Uh, this is a very useful tool to check and see if you need a second opinion or an outside consultation uh, to uh, know what is going to be valuable to prevent illness, to screen for illness, and to diagnose it early. So now we come to uh, excellent answer, by the way. Thank you. So now we come to a patient that uh, has gone through chemotherapy. Uh, it came back a number of times. And after a number of uh, treatment programs, they decide it's enough. I've, I've decided to stop therapy and it's okay for me to die. How do you work with the patient uh, that comes to you? Uh, with that kind of a statement? Uh, this is a common problem in oncology, uh, not unusual at all. And so I have two types of patients. I have the types of patients and their families who say, oh my gosh, I've had enough of this. It is really time uh, to focus on uh, quality of life for whatever time I have left. I don't want to spend all that time in the doctor's office or the infusion center or the hospital, et cetera. Uh, and in those patients, I talk to them about hospice and palliative care. Uh, palliative care physicians, a very popular specialty nowadays, and very well regarded because of their ability to talk to patients about controlling their symptoms, not just fighting a disease. Uh, and those patients are willing to accept that and willing to look at palliative care uh, for their symptoms, pain, fatigue, uh, anxiety, depression, sleeplessness, etc., without actually giving some therapy for their disease. And at an appropriate time, switching into a hospice type of program where uh, they know that they have a more limited length of time to live and they have more people helping them either at home or in an inpatient hospice. And I have the other patients who have exactly the same stage of disease, exactly the same number of treatments, but these patients or their families together say, I know I've been through everything, but... I still want to see if there's anything that can be done for me. Now, the patient who's all worn out and doesn't want anything else, the patient who wants everything else done, even at late stages where it may be clinical trials or it may be hormonal treatments, things, um, immunotherapy with less side effects, both of these approaches are correct. What's different is what's going on in the minds of the patient and the family. And so when I talk to patients, I say, listen, you've been through a number of treatments, and there are two approaches. We can just do symptom control, or we can go to the next treatment. And both those decisions are correct. You just have to decide what is correct for you at this time. And the patients can then go home and talk with their families, see what they want to do. Most of the time, they already know what they want to do. And then I can take and go the path that is most appropriate for them. Uh, 
Is it a clinical trial? Is it uh, more a uh, uh, low toxicity type of treatment program? Is it palliative care and hospice? And by my supporting them, regardless of what clinical trials I have available, what chemotherapy I have available, uh, what my own approach might be for me, we know that they are getting the approach that is right for them. And I feel good at the end of the day that we've done the right thing for the patient. Sometimes, just as with initial therapy for cure, the patients may need a second opinion. And I talk to some patients, I say, listen, let's send you over to the palliative care physician and let's see what they suggest for you now. You can accept it or you can come back and say, gee, I want more treatment. Whatever you want to do is acceptable but in this way, we're working together as a treatment team. We're not saying the doctor wants to do this and I want to do that. But you have to come up with a, a team that really does the right thing for you at every stage of your disease. So now you're living in a state uh, like California and many other states where they offer the possibility that someone says, you know, I'd like uh, you to write me that prescription uh, so that I can choose the time that I want to die and uh, be with my family at that point. That's something new and very big in our country right now. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, we've talked about this very extensively. We know that the uh, law permits patients to get this. But one thing that I've realized is to do this for a patient, you really need special training and experience to do it correctly. Only about 60% of patients who are given lethal doses of prescription drugs actually take them. Mm -hmm. That means at home, they've got, for those other 40%, they've got a lethal amount of drugs sitting in the medicine cabinet. Could someone accidentally take that? There have been overdoses and problems in Oregon and other states where this is, they have a longer experience with this. So I've realized that in order to do this correctly, we have to have an, a trained and experienced physician doing that. And at City of Hope, where I work, that physician is a palliative care physician. And so I refer the patient to mm -hmm. the palliative care physician who not only can take care of their symptoms, not only can determine if this is just a patient who's so depressed they need some good antidepressants, not euthanasia, but they can make the right decisions for the patient. And this then gives the patient the right kind of support that they need. And I support the patient completely as they go through this process. But the actual prescription, I leave it to another doctor. Some primary care physicians are really good at this and doing it themselves. They don't require an outside opinion. Uh, but I do think it's important for a patient to be with a physician who's experienced in helping the patient navigate that actual decision. I don't discourage them from doing it. I don't uh, encourage them to do it. I respond to their wishes. And when I see that patients uh, begin to ask, there, you've got to have something that I can take that will end the agony. I know it's time for the palliative care physician to begin that explanation with the patient. I initiate it by saying, well, you know, some palliative care physicians uh, do approach patients like this with euthanasia. And I said, you need to talk to them about the proper things that need to be done to be able to do it correctly, things like that. Mm, beautiful. Excellent. Uh, I know that in your position and in your specialty, there's lots of uh, serious things that have to happen. And in order to have your own mental stability and mental health, you have to become a creative person. I know you write uh, an article for the Huffington Post, which I'd like you to mention. And I'd also like to hear about your movie awards. Well, thanks for that question, because, you know, just as we're discussing things today about what are my recommendations for people in general, uh, which is going out to a wide audience, when I'm asked these very same questions by an individual patient and I give an answer to one, I find myself realizing it's only a question for one person uh, and only an answer for one person. And really, so many more people could benefit from the answer. So the first thing I did was to write Surviving American Medicine. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, the book that I published, which is a navigational guide to uh, the treatments that patients can get and these various issues that we talked about today. And as a result of that, I began 
publishing a an article about once per month in the Huffington Post. And these articles can be found under Huffington Post, uh, Carrie Prezant, and they'll pop up and you can see which ones might be appropriate for you. Uh, and that's been very worthwhile in getting information out that not only uh, is of value itself, but it also supplements what I've said in the book, may bring more current issues to mind. Uh, we talk about celebrity illnesses and what their questions are that are appropriate for individuals and what are the tips that you have to take back to your physician based upon what celebrities are getting. Uh, and uh, there are a whole series of those. Also, what's happening with regard to different uh, uh, issues such as PSA screening, mammography, uh, the latest one that I wrote was on birth control pills and what that means about breast cancer. So all these have very succinct, brief tips that you can take back to your physician. Uh, one of the things I do once a year, thank you for asking about it, is I nominate the best films of the year that have health themes. So there's no category in the Oscars for the best health-themed movie of the year, uh, nor is there one for best musical, etc. But Certainly health themes, that is nothing. That's the farthest thing from the Oscars' minds. <laughs> but it's not the farthest thing from your minds or my mind as a patient. Because I want to see what the movies can bring to me as a, uh, the way in which I can look at certain serious kinds of uh, problems. Uh, and so I've done this for the last couple of years, and they've been uh, very important in identifying which films deal with issues that are helpful to patients and discussing, after the movie's done, discussing health or health-related themes with their family, uh, with their friends, and making decisions helpful in their very own lives. Uh, cinema brings issues together to our lives in a very uh, upfront way. You see it on the big screen, or maybe a little screen if you... If you uh, Basically, just take it down on your phone or your TV at home. But when you go to see the big screen or you see an important film through one of these other media, uh, you know that it's touching you in a certain way. And so this year I've nominated five films, best films before. Uh, last year was Manchester by the Sea, uh, which dealt with the issue of heart disease at a very young age. Uh, and grief and guilt, uh, how one deals with grief and guilt uh, in a way that helps your health to be better. Uh, very meaningful, moving film. Uh, in the past, uh, we've nominated films that deal with AIDS and with clinical trials. In the past, we've dealt with uh, films that have uh, looked at uh, Alzheimer's occurring at a very young age, and these are issues that everyone takes to heart. And so this year I've nominated films that deal with issues such as catastrophic illness in a young individual, uh, the big sick, uh, and uh, how a family deals with this. And one of the things that I stressed earlier in the program, Glenn, was the importance of having family that really can support you through a serious illness. Uh, this film uh, looks at that in uh, in great detail. Uh, Blind is a film that uh, deals with how can a patient who's lost one of the most important senses, the sense of vision, uh, deal with having a meaningful and productive and satisfying kind of life. The Family Man uh, deals with an issue of uh, when you're faced with looking at what to do for your job versus what to do to help your family what kind of decision do you make? And how uh, does that make you feel good or bad? And uh, deals with leukemia, deals with clinical trials, it deals with uh, when the first treatment doesn't work. Uh, there's a lot of very important issues in the film and things that many families can deal with. And uh, then I nominated a film, uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, uh, which is a film for television which deals with the very interesting issue of when you go in and you have tissue taken out of your body uh, for the pathology examination, what happens to that tissue? Uh, it's your tissue, 
it can be identified with you now with genes and everything. You can know exactly who that tissue comes from. Did you give permission for that uh, hospital or academic center to actually use those cells for some other purpose? And if it's used for some other purpose, uh, who benefits from that? Is it just the academic institution? Is it you? And so the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks deals with an African-American woman who is treated at Johns Hopkins University. It's all published in the book. Uh, and they never got consent from the patient to use her cells, yet her cells were the very first cells that were ever able to be grown from a cancer patient mm. and begin to learn about what causes cancer, what types of treatments can be done for cancer. As a result of her contribution, we have the fields of uh, screening drugs for anti-cancer activities, and so many of all the treatments that we use today have been a basis based on Henrietta Lacks and her cells that were used without her permission, without any benefit to her, by Johns Hopkins. And in my laboratory, I've used those cells called HeLa cells to help to understand uh, the immune system and how it reacts to uh, patients and what kinds of treatments can be developed for patients. So, she has made an enormous contribution, covered very well in the film, uh, yet at the same time, uh, today, we would not have been able to use her cells without her permission to use those cells and for her realization that anything learned from that did not benefit her per se, but might benefit many other people. It's a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. Carrie, we're coming to the end of our show, and as always, we ask for a health tip, although you've given us an entire group of health tips. <laughs> well, well, I think the uh, most important tip is to find the right doctor for you. Uh, make certain you have health insurance. Uh, and once you have that health insurance, get the right doctor for you. Use uh, the uh, guide in my book, Surviving American Medicine, uh, which is available on Amazon. Uh and can be downloaded or you can uh, buy a copy of the book, have it always around. But you can then test each of your physicians and see if they are the right physicians for you or if you need second opinions or not. Uh, make certain that you stress when you look at that physician uh, that's taking care of you, prevention and early detection. So the tip to take home is take a close look at yourself a close look at your physician, make certain you're on the same page, and make certain that you prevent and screen for diseases so I never have to see you as an oncology patient. <laughs> Beautiful. <clears throat> I'm very grateful to our special guest, Dr. Carrie Prezant, uh, who has shared his wisdom and experience with us and offers a great book. And I recommend this book to everyone. It, it shows that uh, medicine and health is really a team sport, and it's uh, appropriate that part of the team is the patient, and you really need to become more experienced. Don't allow just the healthcare system to take care of your health. Be, be an important part of it. Mm -hmm. I want to thank all of my teachers and my healers for keeping me on my journey, for Christina and Segovia and Yoga Hub, and all of our uh, viewers and support systems around the world. I look forward to getting together on Magical Medical Tour again in another uh, episode where we will explore another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy. Until that time, thank you so much, Dr. Prezant, and I wish you all optimal health. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Prezant, for gifting us with your expertise. What an amazing show. And uh, Dr. Glenn Woolman for another great show. Uh, we would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're always grateful for your continuous support, and we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. You can connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman through his website, glennwoolman.com, where we encourage you to learn about his metaphor square breath, or follow him on Facebook at The Medical Guide. You can connect with our wonderful guest, Dr. Carrie Prezant, through his website, survivingamericanmedicine.com, and also through Facebook, Surviving American Medicine. Um, and uh, we really encourage you to take a look at this book. It's very amazing. And as Glenn and I had stated in the beginning, 
it, it, it should be a household book that every household should have and be able to, to educate ourselves with such knowledge of, uh, the way to take care of ourselves and, um, and not show up in his office. <laughs> We hope that you have enjoyed this moment on YHTV and it has supported you or a loved one in some way. We invite you to take a moment to like us or subscribe to our YouTube channel. And this will really help to broaden our message to others around the world. We're always grateful for your feedback and comments and suggestions. Simply type them into the comment box or give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818-LET'S-TALK. Until next time. Namaste.